Thank you. I really, it's really an honor to be here with you all today. So, and we have the honor of Dr. Eric Nakakura with us here today. Dr. Nakakura is a gastrointestinal cancer surgeon who specializes in tumors of the pancreas, bile ducts, liver, and GI tract. He also treats soft tissue sarcomas, including tumors of the retroperitoneum, trunk, and extremities. Dr. Nakakura is a leading authority on endocrine carcinoid tumors of the gastrointestinal tract and pancreas. In 2017, he was awarded a $1.2 million grant from the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation to elucidate the causes of small and intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. And today, Dr. Nakakura is going to be talking about surgery for neuroendocrine tumors, basically what, what you should expect and what questions you should ask. Welcome, Dr. Nakakura. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> so I hope that you know this is um, this is mainly for information for you. So please feel free to ask questions at any time. There's no there's no structure. So I, I really want to make sure all your specific questions are answered. <clears throat> and I'm recognizing that neurotic tumors spans a whole spectrum of diseases. It's not just one disease. Um, I really want to make sure your individual questions are answered. So if um, a topic comes up, but you have a specific question uh, related to your, your underlying problem, uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or just, just uh, ask a question. So for those who I, ha who I, who I haven't met yet, I'm, I'm one of the surgical oncologists that deals with um, the surgical aspects of neurotic tumors. Please. Come. We have a good fortune here. I have a a uh, very um, active uh, neurotic tumor multidisciplinary group at UCSF. And what does that mean? It's, it's not just one person, it's a group of people. And Emily Bergsland, um, who many of you know, is, one, is the lead um, medical oncologist that um, has been largely responsible for helping organize a lot of events like this and uh, getting our center of neurotic tumors together. And it's important to know that it's not just one person who evaluates and comes up with a treatment plan, but it's a whole group of people who will, you know, process all the bits of information from each patient and try to come up with a personalized treatment plan that we think will uh, best benefit that patient. So again, although I'm one person speaking about surgery, a lot of things that I do is part of this larger group where we, you know, thoroughly discuss each and every patient before we do a, um, recommend any treatment. This is the overall agenda, and again, we can spend as much or a little time on each topic depending on um, your particular interest, but these are some of the uh, surgical aspects that I think are important to disease, and these are the, some of the things that um, uh, Emily Burson thought might be uh, useful to uh, at least serve as a framework to uh, start off this uh, discussion. So the first question, you know, what is the role of surgery in neuronal disease? Well, I think if anybody has tumors that's localized to an organ, there's no question that surgery is the treatment of choice because that's the only way to potentially cure the disease. Um, but the fact is many patients have tumor that you know, extends beyond the, the primary organ of interest. You know, people have spread to the uh, parts of the abdomen, to the liver, or other parts of the body. Surgery also has a role in, that, in those instances too because um, even if the tumor has left the initial organ, like the pancreas or the intestine, um, if we can remove all or most tumor in a safe manner, um, we know that patients benefit from that. And why is that? Well, neurotic tumors, as you know, is we kind of look at it at, as cancer in slow motion, that it could be months or years before there's any growth of tumor. So if, if we can remove all or most disease, we say that can set back the clock for the disease, meaning that at least for that time point, a patient may not have as much tumor burden and hopefully not have uh, any regrowth of tumor for a very long time. Now there's some patients that I've seen and operated on more than 10 years ago who had tumor you know, to other, spread to other parts of the body such as the liver or abdominal cavity and uh, we removed you know, all the tumor we could see with their eyes and you know, over, over a decade some patients have no meaningful disease that we can track and so we know that surgery can provide durable control of even advanced disease. In situations where we can't remove all or most disease, surgery also plays a role if 
uh, patients are having symptoms. Now, for many patients with neuroendocrine tumors, you can have issues with blockage of the intestines, manifesting as weight loss, nausea, or vomiting. And sometimes doing surgery to undo that blockage can play a very important part of treatment. Um, there are patients also that have these neuronal tumors that make hormones that can cause um, debilitating symptoms such as diarrhea. And oftentimes if we can remove, again, debulk as much tumor as we can, that can really decrease the load of hormones that the tumors are making. Um, does anybody have a specific question in this regard of surgery in a, in a general term they'd like to ask now? I'm happy to, to tackle that. Yes. Lasers. Um, so you, you're still talking about like you know stage four, you know that kind of tumors all over. You can still use surgery. You know, again, it, the short answer is in select cases. And um, what it comes down to is you know again this multidisciplinary input. You know, inputs from the radiologist, pathologist, uh, uh, oncologist, and, and myself. And it depends on uh, a lot of things. Uh, what type of tumor is it exactly? Because not all neuronic tumors behave the same. So, you know, important part is how fast is it growing? Um, how, how healthy is a patient? Uh, what would be involved with any surgery to, to deal with that problem? And is there a reasonable plan to safely remove all the tumors um, and, and, and leave a, a very good quality of life after that? So it's hard to give a, that's why we can't ever say yes for everyone, but in every case needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. But surprisingly, in cases where, you know, many people thought surgery wasn't possible, it turns out surgery may be possible or vice versa. So it really has to be looked at by a group and, and, and assessed carefully. And, um, but, I, but I just know from personal experience, there's been many patients who were told never surgery, and then we see the patient go, of course surgery, and it's like a complete 180. You know, so... It, it, um, I think you just need to be seen by a, a multidisciplinary group where there's a, where you see a lot of patients that have this, you know, very complex but rare problem, and um, you know benefit from the experience and the expertise of um, that group. Any other questions? Yes. If you, if you ever tell patients who've been told here that their tumors are inoperable, can that over time change? In other words, later on down the road? Um, you know, I understand that a decision for surgery a lot of the time relates on, you know, location. And so obviously the tumor is not going to move to a new neighborhood, but later on down the line, um, do you sometimes go in and do something for that tumor? And the answer is yes. yes. <clears throat> I'll give you some examples about, uh, I'll give you some ge just general examples from uh, real life experiences, okay. So there's the general uh, instance where someone, let's say, was evaluated in the community and, and said, you know, surgery's not possible. And that, you know, obviously, the easy solution is come to a, a center where they deal with uh, this a lot and get a, you know, a multidisciplinary input. And, in that situation, it's not uncommon that we'll say yes, surgery is possible. Okay, that's that's a very that's a that's the most common scenario where patients are initially told surgery is not possible. Uh, another thing is um, um, is time. You know, for example, it may be someone's diagnosed with um, disease that spread to different parts of the body. Um, it could be you know today, but now. Things, you know, time has transpired. Now it's three years, four years, five years out from that initial diagnosis. And, and what we've learned over that time is that things have been relatively stable. There hasn't been a dramatic progression of disease. And, and what we saw initially is pretty much what we see now. So sometimes patients like that, that fit that category, where we say, wow, things have been relatively stable for years and years and years. Is there a role for surgery to, to try to remove as much tumor as possible now, now that we know that the kind of the tempo or pace of disease has been very slow? And that's another example where, every, even, even including me, would say surgery wasn't a good idea initially, but time uh, has shown us that because there hasn't been progression in other parts of the body and it's still in the same places, consider doing an aggressive surgery now. Um, there's a, other patients, for example, now that with PRRT, are, is everyone familiar with PRRT? 
Uh, I'll explain it briefly. So PRRT stands for Peptide Receptor Radiotherapy. It, it was just FDA approved, and uh, basically what it does, it, it's a, yes? Go ahead. Oh. Okay. Uh, basically what it is, it's taking um, a man-made form of a hormone that binds to the surface of these neuron tumor cells, and it, it, it links a radioactive molecule that will destroy the tumors. So it's like a kind of a targeted therapy where you inject it intravenously, it goes in the blood and then binds to the surface of the tumor cells and then kills them. Um, so that was just FDA approved. And, and um, there have been patients that have been treated with, with this treatment uh, before it was FDA approved in other countries in Europe, it's been widely available. And we're seeing patients now who, who initially on the uh, CT scanner MRI, we didn't think surgery was possible. They've gotten PRT and then w with some patients have had um, a good response that we subsequently have operated on. So that's an example where we, you know, we look at the imaging and say it's not possible, but then get a therapy and that it is possible. Another situation when, um, is some patients will be diagnosed and we say surgery is not possible. They'll get um, uh, chemotherapy, uh, in particular for patients with pancreatic neuron tumors, uh, and we'll see response and then we'll operate. These are just um, you know, a few examples of how you know, we, we, ch we change our assessment over time. So it's important to know that whatever assessment you get initially may change depending on what's happened over a period of months or years, what th how you respond to the therapy, and you know, depending on symptoms and things like that. that cancer, that if it was still like secreting that hormone and it, and it got too much, do they use surgery to keep that down when previously we were told that you weren't going to have surgery again? Yeah, that, that, that is one factor that may uh, push someone to do something like surgery if the hormones that are produced by the tumor are so debilitating that, you know, despite any kind of medical management or symptom management, the symptoms are so bad that we might recommend doing some surgery to decrease that hormone load. But again, it, part of the things that go into the decision are, you know, exactly what it would in, what would it entail to get the tumors out safely? <clears throat> Correct, and, and also the extent of the surgery. You know, how many different parts of the body it's in. So, so all these things kind of go into that, and that's why it's a you know yeah. It can only remove like half of the, say half of the tumors or something, and then, but that would probably decrease the the hormones, but you wouldn't be able to get them all because some of them are. At, does that help? Do they do? So that, that's 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 a question of the day. It's like obviously if you do a surgery that's invasive. You want to be able to improve the symptoms dramatically, and that that thinking goes into this decision. Right. If we, we think we can remove enough that would make a meaningful difference, then that's something to consider. If we, if we look at it and go, I think it's you know, a challenge and unlikely to remove most or all to improve the symptoms, then you know, that would probably shift you know, against doing the surgery. Any other questions on this? Okay. You know, so everyone wants to know what are the outcomes after surgery for um, patients with um, this disease. Now, again, out of all the diseases that patients could have, this is the most um, uh, confusing topic, outcomes, because every patient is so different. And even if you break patients down to different stages, they're very different. And the, why is that? Well, the neuron tumors from different parts of the body behave very differently. They're, they're essentially different diseases. So if you have a neuron tumor of the lungs, that's very different from something in the pancreas, that's very different from something in the uh, intestine. Even within the intestine, they're very different depending on what part of the intestine is. So to be able to give you a, a, a unified answer for all the stages, for all diseases, is impossible because they're so different. And that's why I think it's very important, um, <clears throat> you know, especially if you have advanced disease, to get assessed you know, by a multidisciplinary team because um, each person really uh, deserves a unique solution to their issue. And if you try to read a paper or anything published on the internet or Google about you know, outcomes, it's very difficult to apply that data to your disease. Um, regarding you know side effects, obviously it depends on what extent of surgery you do, and you know it's you know again if you're talking about surgery of the lung, surgery of the liver, surgery of the pancreas, surgery of the intestine, very different potential side effects. Obviously, the 
risk of side effects and how severe severe they are goes a lot into you know what type of treatments we might recommend. Obviously, you want to make sure that the treatment's not worse than the disease. In, in regards to recovery times, for most abdominal surgeries, if it's done through the normal open way, you know, in general, patients are in the hospital maybe five to seven days. And um, I usually tell patients that if they want to go back to work to clear the schedule for about four to six weeks. You know, for patients that have tumors that are amenable to laparoscopic or small incision surgeries, you know, oftentimes they're out of the hospital um, in maybe three to five days and can go back to work uh, sooner. And regarding the benefits, I, you know, again, there's no question that if we think surgery could be done safely and we can remove you know, most or all the disease, there's nothing that's going to get that um, m more immediate and complete removal of tumor burden than surgery. Any questions on this? Yes. The, the micro, the micro, micro tumors. So that it's not it's not showing up on. Mm -hmm. a PET scan that is showing up once we get inside. It's a right. So it's one thing that's uh, very confusing to a lot of folks is, um, uh, you know, you, you know, CT scans or MRIs or PET scans or um, Octrea scans or Dota Tate um, scans, you know, the, it's important to know that they have um, a, a limited resolution in the sense that they can see things that are a centimeter or above uh, pretty good. But once you get below a centimeter, it's very hard to um, image or to say what, what, what it is because it's just below the resolution of the of current imaging standards. So a centimeter is about this big. Obviously, with our eyes, we can see things that are below a centimeter, right? You can see grains of rice, but a grain of rice would not be picked up on a CT scan, for example. And it's not that it was, it's not there. It's just that the current imaging technology can't see things reliably that are below a centimeter. So sometimes when we operate on patients that we, where the scan is reportedly clear, we find you know, these microtumors as you're talking about that could be as small as grains of rice. And it's just that we can't, the technology can't pick up these small things. But obviously with our eyes, we can see these things. To kind of add to that question, um, I had a question in my mind regarding laparoscopic versus open. Are these smaller tumors uh, available to the eye with laparoscopic, or is it open surgery a better way of um, seeing them? Again, it depends on what part of the body you're talking about. <clears throat> For example, um, I'll talk in just two general terms. For patients that have pancreas nerve tumors that are localized to the pancreas, um, especially if they're located on the left side of the pancreas, we can often do these laparoscopic or small incision surgeries where we, we do the exact same surgery as we do open. Um, but, but, you know, because you're making small incisions, it's usually a, a faster surgery, quicker recovery. And you're not, you're achieving all the goals you achieve with an open surgery. So for a pancreas, especially on the left side of the pancreas, you know, uh, if, if it's a suitable situation for a small incision surgery, that's the preferred route. Regarding uh, small intestine or ile ileum hernia tumors, um, we have a lot of experience, and, and, and there's growing experience, you know, worldwide, where you can make, you know, very small incision about this big, right around the belly button, and, and achieve all the goals of open surgery, uh, providing that um, the lymph node involvement doesn't extend too far up near the origin of the vessels. As long as that's not the issue, you can often do the exact same surgery through the smaller surgery, smaller incision surgery. All right. Okay, what should we expect with surgery and how should I prepare for surgery? You know, surgery is um, sort of like running a marathon. You know, you want to be as, uh, as um, healthy and prepared for surgery as you would for any kind of major stressful event. So I think, you know, making sure your nutrition's optimal um, to the extent you're able to eat well-balanced meals and, and optimize your weight. Um, you also want to be active and so again, Literally being as strong and as fit going to surgery will um, allow you to bounce back and recover from surgery. So, you know, I certainly tell patients don't, this is the time to go on a diet. And um, if you don't feel like you want to eat but you still can eat, make sure you eat every, everything um, on your plate and, and supplement it with protein shakes if you can. Because again, um, it's going to be an insult to your body. You're not going to be eating for several days. So, 
you want to make sure that you're not going in um, behind your nutrition and um, uh, you want to be as fit as possible. Now, sometimes patients can't eat because of the disease, and that's, that's a whole other issue. But um, um, oftentimes, you know, if there's like three weeks before the surgery and there's no issues with vomiting or blockages, I think it's very important to optimize your nutrition before surgery. Any questions on this that aspect of it? Yes. You can't eat before surgery. Right. So the not a common problem is patients have a blockage. Okay, the tumor is causing you know blockage in the intestine. So you eat and you vomit if you eat too much. Obviously, that you, you do your best. You just can't eat. Uh, in that instance, oftentimes we we have to do surgery sooner rather than later because um, the more we wait the weaker you're going to be. So in that case, we're kind of forced to operate because it's a, it's a mechanical problem. You know, block it, get, undo the blockage before it, there's any further weight loss. Uh, that's a very good question. So sometimes the disease kind of forces us to move up the pace of surgery. Uh, what questions should I ask my surgeon? Well, let me ask you, you guys, what questions do you think you should ask? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Um, Long story made short, I'm with Kaiser, and they recommended no surgery, which took me to see you. And we're going to go back to Kaiser and try to get them to refer to you, as a matter of fact. But my question to them would be, well, how many of these surgeries have you done? What is your record? What is your expertise? If I'm not convinced that they have the same qualifications as something I can find here at UCSF, that helps my decision, obviously. So. I know it's a straightforward question to the surgeon. You don't mean to take them on the spot, but I want to know their expertise. Yeah. What? Sorry. One thing that's sort of related to this, and I, you know, this is it's a very very common question that you hear people think about or ask, you know, like saying, you know, how many cases do you this, you know, this this procedure, right? Um, I think you know probably a equally important, if not more important, question to ask, especially when you're getting different recommendations is um, explain to me why, why you're making that recommendation, especially if it's not surgery, OK? Because um, I think that's going to, if you want to get an answer of, 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 of what are the obstacles for, uh, or why they're making that recommendation, I think that's probably the more, most powerful way to, for if you want to, if you do want, if, if surgery is an option, that may be the, the one way to get them to realize that maybe they're not suitable, suitable, suitable or qualified to deal with the problem. Because if they're giving you an answer that you then get a, a response that counters that answer, then that's probably the most direct way they'll say, OK, yeah, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing this because I, I didn't realize that this is the issue. And so I think if you, you know, try to attack or, or uncover the reasons for their refusal to operate, that will often um, allow them to I sort of self-realize that, gee, I, maybe I don't know much, much, as much about this disease as I thought, because I didn't realize that there's this other modality, like PRT, out there. I didn't realize that you can do this with surgery. I didn't realize that you know this was a possibility. Quick yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick. Um, the original uh, prognosis was they would go in, laparoscopically remove the tumor from the intestines. But when we, the PET scan came out, it showed that it was metastasized into the liver. That's when they backed off and said the surgery is not advisable at this point. Talk to me. All right. Very similar situation. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 so again, then you can ask them, you know, um, so then you can ask some questions like, you know, why are you saying uh, not to do surgery in the liver when, I, when I've read or I've talked to patients where they've had dinner liver? In what situations would you consider it? If they say never, then obviously that's not the right answer. And, you know, then you say, well, look, there's, there's data. There's actually published reports, papers. There's patients I've talked to that have had this done. You know, they're doing fine decades out. You know, so there's, there's, there's there's ways you, that I think that's how you get through. If they say, "Why?" Well, if they say answers like, "Well, gee, if it's in the liver, there's nothing more I can do," you know, that's that's pure ignorance. And it's, I mean, this this is not uncommon that patients you've ever seen even within you know ten or twenty miles of UCSF get told similar things, and then the first thing we say is, "No, that's not true." You know, we we you know surgery is possible. But not always. It's not not always possible, but I'm but I'm saying. Um, Unless it's being evaluated by an experienced center, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't think you make that conclusion just by seeing a uh, private practice, someone that doesn't deal with this on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Doctors will tell you it's inoperable. 
Absolutely, yeah. No, I'm not, there are situations where yeah. we can't get it all out. And, yeah. and, and that's, but, I, but I think before we make that conclusion, sure. we make sure that it's seen by you know, not just one person, but, but, but by, you know, by a group of patients to make sure that everyone agrees that that's true. Right. Yeah, yeah. So yes. if, if we have some kind of surgery, is there something special we should do about anesthesia? Um, given that, you know, I get a hormone storm that attacks my heart. Mm -hmm. Do I need to have special anesthesia if I have surgery? Right. So one thing that, um, you know, and it's sort of controversial whether this truly helps or not, is um, for patients that have hormone secreting tumors that causes the blood pressure to go up and down, we, um, we by routine, uh, start an infusion of octreotide, which is the, a man-made hormone that decreases the release of these hormones from the tumors. And we'll start that before you even um, go back to the operating room because just the stress of going to sleep can stimulate a release of the hormones. Now, it's sort of controversial because there's no definite proof that giving this infusion prevents it. Um, but it's one of those things that it's so dangerous that you don't want to take the chance and not do it. And you know, and in, in, in the absence of clear data saying that it doesn't work, I think most people would recommend doing that. Specific that when you leave out to the anesthetist, right? Um, well, the answer is for most of these or all these procedures, general anesthesia, and um, as far as the agents that they're giving, they're largely the same. I mean, I, for example, they're not using different a uh, different medication to put you to sleep for a neuron tumor than they are for other tumors typically. And I know I'm a Kaiser patient too. I, I came for my second opinion here. I would recommend. They tell you the sky's blue, you better go out and look. Um, I, I did the tumor board at Kaiser and they said no surgery, not safe. And then I did the tumor board at Stanford and they came back and said the exact same thing. And I went to a liver specialist who said I could start on your liver and you'd have Swiss cheese. So I don't think Kaiser goes out of its way to lie. It I'm just, sorry, what? I couldn't. Could, could I, I did the Kaiser thing first, tumor board, came back and said no surgery possible. Quality of life would be severely affected. Then I went to Stanford. Stanford's tumor board said the same thing. Quality of life will not be good if you do surgery. I went to a liver specialist. He said, you'd have Swiss cheese left if we did surgery. I then did PRRT, which was a great solution. So, you know, sometimes they tell you no, and then down the road you come back and you say, okay, now I've got these tumors that are stable, they're big. Should they be debulked? You know, I don't know. Right. I think that's where I am. Yeah, I think, that, I think the one important thing is no matter where you are, it could be anywhere in the country, is, is it, you know, it's important, that, especially if you're told not to pursue a therapy, or, the, or you know, I think it's important to get as many input, input, opinions as possible. You know, for example, I mean, literally if you ask 10 different specialists in neuron consumers even, they'll give you, you know, probably three different answers. It's not that one of them is wrong. It's that it's, it's obviously there, you have options, and no one knows 100% what is the best option for you. Obviously, different institutions may have certain preferences of what to do first based on experience. And again, it's there's, the, the important thing is to know there's many options. And um, um, you may not get a different answer if you come here or to, to Stanford. From Kaiser, but it's possible you may. But I think it's important to get as much input as you can before you um, make up a decision. Yeah. So I had a hepatic resection, Dr. Warren, and then nine years ago, the hepatic metastases came back, and I went to see him, and I was told it was inoperable. There were 15 sites. I mean, it was all over the place, and. Uh, I went on a creatide and problem solved. Right. So the, 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 the better. You got on the creatide and you're feeling better. Yeah, I was part of the five percent where they actually Very shrink. Oh, wow. Had a shrink. <laughs> oh wow! I just started. Yeah. I just got the they told me that she said, "Well, about five percent of the cases will shrink, but it should stabilize them." And I went back, and she said, "Oh, they shrunk." I said, what did you expect? That's what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, one, one thing, one thing uh, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, you come in here, people say something's inoperable. You know, what does it exactly mean? It may mean a lot of things. 
It could mean that I just can't, no matter what, no one in the world can physically take them out. Okay? It could mean there's too many tumors of the location. It could also mean that people use that term is that the risk benefit is not in your favor. Like, you know, your situation, you, you did better without surgery. So why, so that's, it was inoperable in the sense that you're, you can do, you, you may not need surgery because you'll do just fine without surgery. There's too many sites. And I, I talked to Dr. Fillman about the ablation and <coughs> hey, life is good, why bother surgery? Right. So I, I think it's important to know that if, if someone, especially a surgeon says they don't recommend surgery, um, you know, ask them why. It's not, it may not be a technical thing where it's inoperable. We, we, it may just be that we think you'll do just fine with a non-surgical option and why go through the invasion of a surgery if you might do even better without that risk. Okay. The problem with your gallbladder as a potential, like, from what I've heard, you're going to have gallbladder problems. Um, when should you have it removed? Do you do it ahead of time in anticipation, or do you just wait? Or <clears throat> right. do what, what, you do other surgery at the same time? Yeah, let me do describe. So what, um, what you're referring to is that, um, yeah. The question is, um, if you're on uh, oxyotide or sandostatin or lanreotide, one of the cement sand analogs, uh, should you get your gallbladder removed? The, what, what's the issue? Um, over long term, when patients are on these medications, um, many people develop gallstones. Okay, so the so one of the current um, things to discuss with a patient, if you're doing surgery for another reason, like let's say you're going to go in and do a surgery to remove a neuroendocrine tumor in the liver. Okay, and um, uh, one thing obviously to discuss with the patient is like should should the gallbladder be removed at that setting because of this possible. Um, uh, use of the SMAS analog, analog in the future. And, and the reason is that most people will develop gallstones if they're on the SMAS statin analog for a long time. The thing that we don't know is how many people have a, an attack from the gallstones requiring an emergency surgery or some intervention. That, is, that part is not known. But if we think that we're going to be in there anyways and taking out the gallbladder is not going to add much um, risk to the surgery, we won't hesitate to, to recommend it, especially if someone has liver metastases, because in that setting, they're, they're very likely going to be considered for a spinal statin analog in the future. But also, when people have liver disease, we recommend removing the, the gallbladder for another reason, and that is that it, taking the gallbladder out uh, takes it out of the equation that if they ever develop a, a tumor next to the gallbladder, sometimes they can't treat it because they're worried about injuring the gallbladder. So by getting the gallbladder out of there, then potentially liver-directed therapy or, you know, percutaneous like ablations or things could be done without risk of injuring the gallbladder. So it's kind of a two, two reasons why you might want to consider removing the gallbladder for someone with liver disease. But I wouldn't, but no, I don't think, in the absence of symptoms, you know, the, the fact is that even people without neurocon tumors, people that aren't taking any medications, as you get older, um, your, your risk of developing gallstones increases, okay? But we don't operate on patients with gallstones if they're not causing problems. So if you have no symptoms and it's not causing any problems, we, we do nothing. Because many people live their whole life with gallstones without any problems. So we only recommend intervening if people have gallstones and they have symptoms. So it's, it's, it's for prophylactic, we wouldn't uh, uh, say, OK, you're on octreotide. Let's schedule to take your gallbladder out. We wouldn't do that. If you're on octreotide, you had stones, and, you, and every time you ate something like had uh, fried fatty food and you had you know, nausea and right upper quadrant pain, then we'd say, yeah, take your gallbladder out. Because you, you, once you have symptoms, you're at risk of um, having a complication and ending up in the hospital. Yeah. Do you do um, much work as far as an appellative care situation to improve the quality of life? Let's say you're not going to get all the disease um, removal or <clears throat> bypassing it or something. Or how, how would you address that? Or get right. So, so talking about um, non-curative surgery, um, one of the one of the issues with neuroendocrine tumors that comes up a lot is um, is a blockage of the intestines. So, where the tumor is, you know, pushing down the intestines where patients can't eat. So, in that, in that case, we're not operating to cure. We're operating to improve the quality of life. So, in this case, in, in this case, someone can't eat. They're having nausea, vomiting. They get pain, cramps when they eat certain foods, or um, they're losing weight. In that situation, the goal now is to, is there some way we could, if we could remove the tumor that's causing the blockage, that's preferred, okay? If we can't remove it, sometimes we consider doing a bypass around the blockage 
to give it another another route for the chew, uh, food to get around. Um, so removal of the blockage is the, the, the preferred. If we can't remove it safely, then bypassing it is another option. Kind of lower down the list, if we can't do any of those things and patients still can't eat, sometimes we talk about considering a feeding tube or, or a venting tube in the stomach, but these those are not you know, great solutions, but we consider it if it if we can't do the other things. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to, my experience in questions to ask the surgeon was to ask for specific plans. Yes. Because we got, you know, yeah. from you, we got specific plans from other surgeons, it was very vague. So that for us also tells us, you know, do you have a really a clear vision of what you want to do or potential scenarios or you don't? Right. I think that's why I think asking that question about what what's your plan and the re justification for it is the probably the most important question rather than the numbers because what if someone's doing a thousand of them but they're doing thousands for the wrong reasons you know that's that's not, that's not, that's not great but, but you, you learn more about their thinking if you ask why they're recommending a thing and what's the reason if they can't give you a reason then that's a, you know that's obviously a concern So how does one choose a surgeon? Well, let me ask you guys. How do you how do you choose a surgeon? <laughs> is there a Yelp out there? Whatever your insurance covers. Yeah. Well, yeah. So maybe insurance related, like you have yeah. constraints, like you're you're in Kaiser or non Kaiser, or or Hill Physician or Brown and Tolan, and you can only go to certain. That's that's definitely one. Yeah. Yeah, that's where we are now. Right? Mm. We're comfortable you because of your knowledge, your specification, the time you've spent on this particular tumor. One of the things we found interesting is in one of our last discussions with another oncologist at Kaiser, she in a way admitted that Kaiser systemically nationwide has, uh, and she called it a problem, of uh, training many of their people for general understandings of various things. So they need to know a great many things, um, whereas having a lot of specialists is not their forte. And so we wanted to go with you and Bergson because we felt that you knew the most there is to know in this general area about this particular tumor. Right. I mean, you know, obviously, every any surgeon or any um, institution probably has its you know areas where they're you know you know experts in. For it could be from experience, patient flow, number of referrals, just, and just you know exposure over their lifetimes. Um, no, that's true. So I think that's why, you know, I, regarding Kaiser, I do know that over time they are working on centers of excellence for different you know, diseases or different parts of the body. So, you know, for example, there's certain Kaisers, if you have a certain um, condition, you'll get referred to one of two centers in a geographic area. And so they, they are doing re regionalization for, for, this re for this region. So they're, 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 they're just beginning. She said, if you came in here, Five years from now, eight, ten years from now, we'd be having a different conversation. And that's great, but we're not coming in here five years from now. Right. So, I mean, uh, but this goes with, this goes, this is true no matter where you go in the, in, in the, in the world or country, is that depending on, even if you go within the same institution, for example, if you go to some hospital and you, you, you saw the guy that dealt, was really good at this one thing, um, that's the guy you'd want, obviously, than the guy who doesn't see it as much, right? So. confidence. So when you're talking to the doctor, if that person is um, filling you with trust and confidence and you just trust the person to open you and do the job, I think that's a good thing too. Because you can have a surgeon that has all the best credentials, but you don't trust him for whatever reason. I don't think it's a good conversation or communication or, or pairing because you have to go there confident that the outcome is going to be good. And part of that is right. trusting the doctor. I think, I think trust is very important. I, think I, I thought about this a lot too, and I, I realized how difficult it is. Like, if I, have to, if I have to choose a dentist or something, like, how do I choose a dentist? You know, like, obviously, you ask as many pa patients and people that you know and you trust for the insight. That's I think that's an important thing. Um, but I think it is hard, right? You know, because you have no idea as far as actual surgery. You no know one. It's a big black box, right? You 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 don't get to see the surgery, right? You have no. You don't get to watch the video of the surgery. It's it's like it's like someone like uh, you're trying to pick basketball players for a team, and you can watch them play, right? You're just reading descriptions about oh he scored this many points this game, he played this much, and you know something. But you didn't get to see him dribble the ball, 
shoot the ball, right? Or, and it, you get a lot from that kind of, you know, visual cues, I guess, or experience. And, and you don't get that. So how do you, so what do you do? I, you know, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, you can get request videos or something. But. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I, I came to this cancer with, with an advantage in that I've been a nurse for 40 years. And uh, I am a patient with the VA in Sacramento, which is a fairly small hospital within the VA system. And um, when they finally diagnosed me and you know, had uh, a clear idea of what was going on, I started doing research. Um, you know, I, I had skill sets that most people don't have and knew where to look besides Dr. Google for information. And so Dr. Nakakura didn't say this directly, but if you go to centers that have the most experience with a particular condition, to the very least get the latest information, you can go back and negotiate with the institution that's financially responsible through your insurance company for your care, whether it's Kaiser, the VA, or Sutter or Dignity Health. And they're used to telling you how things are going to go. They've always had that power. But the truth of it is, is that if you can show that there's a standard of care out there somewhere for a particular thing that is the accepted standard of care and what they're suggesting isn't, you've kind of got them over the table. They have to begin to at least listen and negotiate with you. So you have to become, especially with somebody that has a rarer kind of cancer or other disease, you have to learn as much as you can so that you can come and speak with as much authority as you can back to them. Yeah. You know, you know, picking, a, picking a surgeon, for me, it was, they had to be humble and curious and have small hands. I'm not a big person. You're going into my abdomen, so would you? <laughs> but so, so, you know, the chief of surgery at Major VA is a great big, big guy, an older doc, old school. He wanted to do a full open. I had a, I had a distal uh, tumor on my, on my pancreas the tail. And I said, no, they're doing it laparoscopically at Stanford, UCSF. And I said, you're not going to open me up. I said, you need to find somebody that can do it laparoscopically. Fortunately, they had somebody. And she fit my criteria. She was humble, curious. She had done lots of laparoscopic surgeries. She'd never done one of these. But Dr. Bold at UCSF, or UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center had. So I said, why don't you put them together? Because the VA often has people come over from other institutions to provide supportive, you know, direction. And so we kind of created our own team. You know, they're, they're not used to thinking in a team way, but, you know, you're right. It has to be a multidisciplinary approach. You have to find somebody that you're comfortable with and it's going to do the thing that's going to work the best for you. Is it quality of life? Is it, you know, what is it you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to put in a plug for Northern California Neuro and, and Tumor Group. Uh, I've heard a lot of questions about Kaiser. We have a mailing list with subgroups, and one of the subgroups is the Kaiser Group. And it's a lot of people that know Kaiser, that network, that know who to ask the questions of. Anyway, Good, we, we meet the 7th of next month out in Walnut Creek. All the people here on staff know about it. Um, we have it on our calendar. Yeah, it's it's, it's a good group. It's the same. It's the same. A lot of good information, and yeah, we I, have I, speakers from here. Yeah, one thing I can say is it's probably the most informed patient group that is around anywhere for any disease. It's amazing. The, the people that are involved in the world, I have to say, they're very um, on top of it. He's at the, Euro, the European ENET, the European Neuronicon Tumor Society meeting. Josh, yeah, Josh, yeah. So, I mean, Josh writes things that are published in medical journals to advise patients. So, he, I mean, this guy is. I mean, he's yeah. leading the effort as yes. far as patient he, advocacy worldwide. He's a force, uh, force to be reckoned with. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, what's your view on how 
um, important it is for the surgeon once there's once you've decided what the surgery is to be to really understand the disease. Oh, I, I think it's critically critically important. Yeah. Even even once the like if you're going to have a whipple and you know there's no getting around it. Um, does it make a difference if you go over to CPMC and you get the guy who's done a ton of whipples, but is not, you know, he's in and he's out and he's not, they're interested in him. See, this is, a, this is a philosophical thing. You know, I, it's more than just the technical exercise because especially when, you know, things, variables such as the extent of surgery, you know, what is done, what is assessed, and what can be done, uh, is a very important part of doing surgery, especially for nerve tumors, where it's not simply just an issue of, you know, you show up, you get operation A. Operation, there's things you got to look at, things you got to consider. Um, techniques of removing tumors in the liver for nerve tumors is very different from other tumors. So if you, for example, one thing we know from having, uh, uh, dealing with nerve tumors in the liver is you don't need to resect a normal rim of margin around the tumor, uh, you can just uh, effectively carve out the tumor, or we'll call it nuclei, which is, it's like in a melon scoop, you scoop out the melon. So you can leave essentially all the liver behind and just scoop out the tumors. It's very unique to nerve tumors because nerve tumors don't come back when you do that. If you do that with other types of tumors, it'll come back. So other tumors, we have to take usually a centimeter of normal liver around it. To get it out. With nerve tumors, when there's a lot of tumors, you just can't do that and leave enough normal liver behind. And that's why I talked about Swiss cheese liver. But for neuronic tumors, you can do very extensive uh, removal of tumors in the liver by doing this enucleation technique. Now, if, if the person who is a liver specialist is treating the, the liver tumors just like they do any other cancers, they're going to tell you it's not resectable. They're going to tell you, uh, or they're going to do this more extensive resection, take out big parts of your normal liver to get the negative margins when they didn't need to. So in this case, this is, that's, a, that's a very good example of why um, when I see patients go to other, I mean, I see patients go to very good centers and world famous liver surgeons, and for a tumor that's this big, they've taken out 80% of the person's liver. And all they needed to do was just enucleate and cut out that thing and didn't have to the risk of liver failure. All, just, it's because the person was in their mind was treating it as other kind of cancers where they have to do that more extensive resections. And it's, that's, that's, a, that's a, the clearest example of how it could be life or death. Because you do a big extensive surgery like that that you didn't need, the mortality could be as high as 25%. If, that, if you didn't have to even undergo that major resection, that's a, that's a big example of why you wouldn't want to do that. Or why you need to understand the disease process. Because it's not simply as a technique. You just show up and get it taken out. When we, we went with our surgeon ahead of time and you know got to know him and thought everything you know felt comfortable with him, but then on the day of the surgery we got like the backup guy. So <laughs> it, was, it, was a guy. it was a partner. A partner. So like is it a or something? Or no, they just, they just trade off. You know. Is that normal? <laughs> <laughs> it's not normal here. I know. It's, I, I think it's no, it's normal in like the, the UK. You know, you know, I spent I spent like six months in the UK as part of my training, and uh, it's really different there. Like for example, the guy you see in clinic will, will not be the guy you see in the operating room. Like you'll go, you'll just show up to a major problem, go up to the clinic. A guy will, guys will be there in the clinic and say, "Oh yeah, you need this operation." They'll book you, and whoever shows up that day is going to be your surgeon. It's 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 very unsettling from uh, an American point of view, but that's how. But that because they're so uh, happy. To have someone operate on them within a reasonable time frame, because every you know it's the universal healthcare, and there's such a big weight that once they get in the system, they just want to get it done. They don't want they're not going to start demanding that I want this surgeon to do it, unless you're going to pay out of pocket. And obviously, if you you know do private practice, you can get whatever you want. But if you part of the universal health service, you just got to be helpful or thankful that you're getting treated at all. I see. Check in. I won't stop anyone from answering, asking questions. So I will have a pad of paper. If you do have questions that we're not able to get to, um, I'll have a uh, we can write them down so we can follow up as well. I lost that question now. Um, I had surgery uh, about 15 months ago, 
because I had a blockage in my small intestines. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm stage four, metastasized to my liver. What are the chances of getting another blockage and having to have another surgery? So it depends on, uh, it, I mean, specific in your case, you know, um, what was left in the intestines after that surgery? Obviously, if there's nothing left, then the risk of recurrent blockage is, is, is very low versus, you know, it's more or, or much of the disease was left behind um, during that. So, so it depends on what was left behind after that surgery. What about four inches of small intestine as well as my gallbladder? and an ovarian system, my ovaries, and muscles, mm -hmm. just get rid of everything. Right. <laughs> for, oftentimes for patients that have the American tumors in the small intestine, it's not the, it's not often the tumor that's causing the blockage, but it's the lymph node spread that causes, you know, it, it bubbles intestine, it causes it to kink, and taking out the tumor in the intestine plus that lymph node, um, Mass is important because it's the lymph node mass that causes the blockage. Sometimes we can't remove that lymph node mass because it goes up to the root of where the vessels start. I have one there too. All right. So, so that's another one. Right. So that's why I'm saying it depends on what was left behind. If there's nothing left behind, the risk is much lower than if there's something left behind. Oh, there's no chance of new growth. There always is a chance of new growth, but that's what I'm saying. The, chan the, the chances of it causing a problem are much lower if it, if it has to start from nothing visible to versus there's something there they can see already. Okay. Yeah. For anyone that's had surgery already, um, do you have any kinds of like tidbits or, or guidance or things that you could share with the rest of the group that might help them prepare? I felt like surgery was less hard after I did it than before. Like the coming up to surgery was more of a anxiety for me than after when you when you've had the surgery. Like, wow, it's not really that bad. I, I mean, I healed really quick. I got back on my feet really quick, and it was like the coming up to the surgery that was more, I guess, hard on me because I was stressed out all the time. And then after I was like, oh well, that was really kind of nothing. You know, like compared, like I mean, I'm, I mean, I had a whole my whole colon removed and everything, and I it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So uh, just the anxiety of it in the beginning seems to be worse. You know, like I don't know, every surgery is different. Though, you know. I think important one thing too. Oh. Yes. I think the the physical is not was not the worst, but the emotional is the worst. You know, and if you if you haven't been in the hospital before for long periods of time, it's it's pretty risky. I mean, it's pretty. I don't know how to say it. it's scary. It's scary. Yeah, it's pretty scary. So really, having getting your emotional support system. I mean, that's just for me. Getting your emotional support system in place before you go in is great. Because the to me, the physical was not the the worst part of it. You know, so. Yeah. What you guys gonna say is that. It's important to periodically just get a like a, a, a new look at your your disease, whether it's from you know a different person or a different group or the same group, but ask the a question that was like if, you're, if they said you're inoperable before. It's always reasonable to bring it up again over time to, to be reevaluated because there are you know instances like you know, we mentioned about PRRT. Patients are getting PRRT, and um, some patients where surgery wasn't considered are now considered. Um, some forms of systemic therapy, some people are put on capecitabine and uh, uh, temozolomide for pancreatic nerve tumors and getting great response and where surgery wasn't feasible, surgery is possible. Another thing was with the, you know, patients that I probably wouldn't have operated on 10 years ago, now because we're doing the enucleations, we're, we're operating on. So the indications or kind of the ability to operate on patients where we couldn't offer surgery before is changing even in the short time of years you know, with PRT and stuff. So it's important to get reevaluated, I think. And, and uh, um, so don't, I wouldn't accept whatever someone told you five years ago it applies to today. It may be very different. You, if you were to do PRT, would they come to you with that if you're eligible for that? Or was that something that you'd go to your doctor and ask? Them like I think you have to go, you have, you have to go and ask. I think especially if um, it's not, 
it, Little just got FDA approved in the last, you know, what, I was told about weeks, it, and then, uh, offered. but not every place does it. And, um, and Tom Hope, Dr. Tom Hope does it here. Yeah. Um, but I, I can't say about other, other, other centers where you can get that done. Kaiser does it, I think, in Santa Clara. Dr. Kwong. Dr. Kwong, okay. Some doctors don't seem to be necessarily big fans of ERRT. And then you see little tutorials about it or people being interviewed who are involved in PRT and they are complete fans. And I saw Josh interviewing someone about PRT and he had to say to the doctor, well, aren't there some potential downsides to get that information, you know, out to, you know, out in the in the video. So uh, when I first heard about it, I thought, yes, because I my tumors are, you know, the right grade. And, um, and I thought, oh, great. And they're in a bad spot. So they can't remove them. And, but then there are, you know, apparently problems with it can kill your bone marrow. I mean, it's right. not Right. I think the important thing is, yeah, point. yeah. One thing, you know, this regards, regards any type of therapy, whether it's surgery, PRRT, you know, smetan analog. There's always going to be some side effects, right, and, and drawbacks. And it's important that, again, before anything is done, you you get the input of why or rationale why they're recommending it or why they're not recommending it, and listen to that and listen to the explanation. It may be PRT is not a good idea for you know. You know, extensive bone mets where you're worried about bone marrow suppression and all these other things. It may not be a good thing where surgery is better because it's all can be removed in the liver. Um, it may be better, liver directed therapy may be better because um, there's nothing outside the liver, whereas PRT goes throughout the body. So there's all these things that go into recommending a treatment. I'm, you know, it's important not to say I want, you know, surgery or I want PRT and, uh, without listening for the reasons why you should or shouldn't get it. Um, yeah. To your doctor, I'm really interested in PRT. Well, you should. I, I, I'm really interested in hearing about it and okay. whether it's recommended or not. Is, is a, does is a that does, is that something that the tumor board would evaluate? Correct. And or start with you know probably seeing someone like Dr. Hope or or you know or anybody who deals with neurotumors to ask whether that's recommended or or should be a consideration. Um, then absolutely, if, if it gets to the point where it's not clear and there's other options, then I think going to the tumor board is important. But if it, it may be that everyone's saying, yes, it's a perfect solution. Or people may say it's not a great solution. But you at least should be assessed for it and hear why or why not it's recommended. Right. And Dr. Hope did a, this is where, where you want to go to the uh, Northern California Carcinet site because Josh has access to world class doctors and they will sit down and he will interview them. And that's all these little films are on the website. Great. Well, Dr. Um, Hope will be coming to an upcoming meeting. Dr. Hope will be coming to an upcoming meeting here too in the next couple of months. So Right, yeah. Yeah. So uh, so he's done he's done, you know, little videos about PRT. And he actually has gone to Germany. But one of the things that Dr. Hope said on the video is that there and other doctors is that there's there's going to have to be some time now for hospitals to get up to speak, so they have the resources and the training and the facilities to do the PRG. So it's an option where you need to figure out well. Where can I go in the U.S. where it's available, or do I, should I go to Germany, which is where you know people have gone uh, in the past? So it's good to find out where it's available. And it's important to note that sometimes the best treatment recommendation is observation, uh, where patients can do well for months or years with no treatment, and and where the treatments can have more of a problem or more uh, risk or impairment in quality of life. 
Uh, so sometimes, you know, observe, although sometimes people feel uneasy about recommendations of let's just watch you, that may be the best for your overall quality of life um, because patients literally can have no symptoms, no growth for years, in which case doing anything is not necessary. This portion of our meeting today. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeffrey.